Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I can see there's almost 50 of you uh, joining the call tonight. Uh, we're really grateful to have all of you. Uh, maybe if you're comfortable just in the chat, uh, share your name, uh, the organization that you're affiliated with and uh, the which nation's territory you're calling in from, if you know that, just so we can get an idea. Uh, my name is Torrance. I'm the campaign director at the Wilderness Committee, and I'm calling in this evening from the unceded Lekwungen territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt people. Uh, anywhere in BC or beyond is the territory of an Indigenous nation, and we all have a duty to learn our responsibilities on these lands and to strive for a future where uh, Indigenous peoples have justice and dignity and where land is returned to Indigenous nations. I also want to add that colonialism is not a thing of the past, it's, it's ongoing. Uh, just this week, uh, New Chanoth communities on the west coast of Vancouver Island are dealing with yet another shooting of a community member by the RCMP, and this is a reminder that this process is, on, is ongoing. So I'd like to ask all of you this evening to join us in extending your thoughts and love to the families and communities who are dealing with this at this time. For those of you who don't know the Wilderness Committee, we're actually not an outdoor recreation group. We're an environmental advocacy group that primarily works on campaigns on everything from forest protection to endangered species to climate change. We do get people outside as part of this work, including as part of our trail building program where we partner with different First Nations to bring volunteer groups out to build trails and contribute to other tourism infrastructure projects. We're very grateful to the co-host of this evening's webinar, the Outdoor Recreation Council, which represents more than 50 groups across BC and has worked to promote outdoor recreation for 45 years. Thank you to the ORC and to all of its member groups who are with us this evening. As groups who work in and around outdoor recreation and outdoor spaces, it's important that we recognize that the use of and enjoyment of lands and waters in this country has contributed to colonization and dispossession of indigenous peoples, sometimes even as much as development or resource extraction. Addressing this and, and doing better are a huge priority and we're excited to be holding a conversation about that this evening. Tonight, we have three incredible speakers who you can see on your screens who are going to provide their perspectives on this topic and provide some insight for all of us. This is by no means a comprehensive overview of how to decolonize your outdoor activities. The aim is to get us thinking and asking questions. And our hope is that all of us will continue to learn uh, about the nations uh, where, on whose territory we work and the land we get out on and ensure that our outdoor activities are done in respectful ways that challenge rather than uphold colonialism. The three speakers will be done by about 10 after eight, at which point we'll have some time for question, a question and answer session, uh, which my colleague Emily will facilitate. You can see her on your screen, uh, as well as uh, my other colleague Alex, who shows up as the Wilderness Committee logo. Uh, the two of them uh, organized this evening's event. Um, so yeah, Emily will start that will facilitate the Q&A at 10 after 8. Uh, if you have questions while the speakers are talking, uh, please, you can see a question and answer uh, box down at the bottom. Please put your uh, question in there and we'll read out as many as we can, maybe combine some if there's related ones. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you can, I, I think, Emily, can they see them too? Um, just, just nod or, or shake your head if, yeah, you should be able to see the questions. So, you know, if someone asked the one that you were going to add, uh, you won't have to. Um, so with that, uh, thanks again for coming and I'll pass it over to our first speaker this evening. Mariah Charlson is an outdoor educator from the Heshquiet First Nation and the vice president of the New Channel Tribal Council. I've learned a lot from Mariah on social media and I'm excited to hear from her tonight. Take it away, Mariah. Awesome, thank you so much for the warm welcome. I'm just fiddling around with my thing here just to get to the beginning of my presentation and I will get going. All right, so before I begin my presentation today and before I formally introduce myself, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional unceded territory of the Snenemoch people, a place that I am very privileged and honored to live, laugh and learn and a place that has been uh, occupied and lived upon for thousands and thousands of years. 
I'm really excited to be here today. Oklas Luchin Suta, Mariah Charlson, Heshqui Oxops, Kin Quash to Klump Oxops, Ohox Aichum, Karen Charlson, Ohish Stephen Charlson. So what I said there is my name is Tluchin Tsuta. That's my Koas name. My English name is Mariah Charlson. I am a woman from the Heshkwit First Nation and I am a woman that belongs to the house of Kinkwash Tukump. I also at this time would like to acknowledge my grandparents on my father's side, Stephen uh, Senior Charlson and Jean Little from a house in Heshkwit First Nation, as well as my grandparents on my maternal side. Uh, Stella and Niels Ritter from Estonia and Denmark. So today I will be presenting to you folks a little glimpse of what I think uh, means decolonizing spaces. So the title of my presentation is Decolonizing Spaces Through Acknowledgement and Understanding of Truth. So as a Heshkwit woman, as, an, as a Kinkwash to Kumpf woman, I'm reminding you all that um, that is the lens in which I will be sharing my story today with each of you. And, uh, all right, so just an overview of what I will be chatting with you folks about today is I'm going to start off with why. So why is it important? Uh, why is creating space for truth sharing so important in the work of decolonization? I'm going to go through an activity with you folks today, and we're going to do a speed session, a speed timeline on uh, impacts that colonization has had on our people to this date. I'm going to share my story, as I had mentioned, through the lens of a Kinkwash de Klumpf and a Heshkwit woman. I'm going to shine light on truth, and I was going to put truth in the middle, um, but I just decided to put it in the middle. It's are along in the circle because it's going to be a part of my presentation today. Once we go over though that timeline, as well as some of the stories that I will be sharing, I'm also going to highlight some of the impacts that colonization has had on our people. If we have time, because 20 minutes goes by really quick, we will talk about reconciliation. It's a huge, massive word. Uh, stay tuned if there's time at the end. And moving forward, there is definitely going to be time for that because I want to make sure that that's where I end my presentation in a good way uh, with realistic tools that you can use in the work that you do. So with that, I'll get going. So why? Why is imp it important that we create space to acknowledge truth? When I used to travel around the province with this fellow named Micah Meesent, he used to travel all around the province with this bag of beads. And he would reveal one bead and he would say, this bead represents me. And then he would explain everything he's seen in his life. And then he would reveal the second bead. And he would say, this bead represents my mother and my father. And he would explain their experiences and so forth. And then he would say, and this is how long my people have been right here on these lands. And then he was over six feet tall. And he would stand there with these beads and it's that connection. Our people have been on these lands and waters for thousands of years. And it's an acknowledgement of the really grim and dark past is what's going to be critical in moving forward in a good way. Having those really uncomfortable conversations that we're beginning to have now are absolutely necessary for us to move forward in a good way. And that's why I think it's important to create space to share truth so that we can begin to decolonize our spaces around us. So we're going to jump right into a timeline activity. And we're going to imagine, I was kind of thinking, okay, I'm going to be the first speaker. And typically we start with like an icebreaker kind of thing. We're going to imagine that we're all in a big, awesome, amazing field somewhere. And it's just super awesome. We're all comfortable. And I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And then everybody's standing. And I'm going to ask the crowd a series of really super random questions. And you're going to think, is this lady crazy? Like, if you wore red socks this morning, sit down. If you have more than two sisters that are older than you, sit down. If you drank coffee this morning with your breakfast, sit down. You kind of get the idea. 
So this is a visual representation of a really important time in history that I wanna begin with. And this time in history, so we're gonna imagine that everybody was standing and slowly people are beginning to sit. We're gonna imagine in this room full of a hundred people that there is now, let's just say nine people remain standing. Those nine people that remain standing represent a time in history that has impacted indigenous people all across the Americas. And that's the measles and the smallpox epidemic. The way that my father explained it to me as a child is he said, you picture a metropolis city like Vancouver. You have your doctors, your lawyers, your teachers, you have somebody who will come and fix your road. You will have somebody who specializes in fixing your lights if your lights don't work. He said, now I want you to imagine that we take away 90% of those people. That 10% of the people remaining left, I would then ask the people standing, I would ask them a series of questions, beginning with, do you think that you would be able to do the work of everybody in this room? And we all know the answer of that. And I would ask a series of questions to those people that were remaining standing. And then I would remind the entire crowd that those people that are left standing are about to partake in a really dark time in history that I'm about to share with you folks today. And before I jump into that, I want to acknowledge that this is going to be uncomfortable. I want to acknowledge that it's not going to be pretty. And I also want to acknowledge that this isn't for us to carry. And it's not anything to feel guilty over, but it's an understanding of truth so we could move forward. So at this time, we have... Um, nine people remaining, about 9% of the population. And we must remember many of our nations were entirely wiped out. Hashkrit, where I come from, it's told that we were down to single digit numbers. I've heard similar stories throughout the coast. So now we're at a time where our population is severely depleted. 1763 was the Royal Proclamation, a document that set out guidelines for European settlement of First Nations territories Treaties were solely handled by the Crown. There was no consultation with the Indigenous people who have occupied these lands for thousands of years. By 18 of 80, 1867, we know Confederation, be the BNA Act, the creation of Canada, gave federal government responsibility over First Nations and all of their territories, lands, resources, with zero consultation. In 1876, there was federal legislation that still impacts me today. Something known as the Indian Act was passed. What the Indian Act did is it extinguished any remaining self-government for First Nations people, making them wards of the federal government. It was aimed to eradicate First Nations people as well as their culture. By the 1870s, the very first residential schools began to open. By 1884, there was an amendment made to the Indian Act, which made attendance to these Indian residential schools compulsory. If you didn't wanna send your child to one of these Indian residential schools during this period of time, you could be arrested. From 1885 to 1951, there was yet another amendment made to the Indian Act that I'm going to read a direct quote from. Every Indian or other person who engages in or assists in celebrating the Indian festival known as the Potlatch or in the Indian dance known as the Tamanawas is guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be liable to imprisonment. So picture what our perspective is of our CMP right now, of the justice system. From the 1950s to the 1980s, many would argue till now, is something widely known as the 60s scoop, a large scale removal of First Nations children to predominantly non-First Nations homes for the sheer purpose of assimilation. To this day, you can actually Google and find ads in newspapers of young First Nations children being sold at a very low cost. You can Google it with a simple Google search. You can find these things. So now we're gonna jump ahead and I wanna acknowledge that that wasn't some pretty, that was not um, 
it wasn't a pretty time in history, but it, I want to acknowledge that it took place. So now we're jumping forward to now my father's time. My father is born. I'm all, my story is almost here. I'm just about to be created. And I'm going to share uh, how the government has really done a good job in displacing our people from our territories. And I'm going to use personal story and experience. So the image on your left is the image of Hot Springs Cove, Heshkwa Indian Reserve number six, according to the federal government of Canada. That's where I grew up. The image on your right is the Heshkwa Hahuthli, the traditional territory of the Heshkwa people. The thing about the reserve that I grew up in is that it's outside of those traditional boundaries. And there's reason for that. So as early as the 1800s, the federal government of Canada was already doing a really good job of displacing us from our resources and made it illegal for us to traditionally harvest salmon the way we have for thousands of years. They said, all right, you have to get a commercial fishing license and a commercial fishing vessel, just like everybody else. So our hash group people went and they did that. And when you look at the west coast of Vancouver Island, you'll know that Heshkwit territory is not protected whatsoever, unless you go way inside the harbor there where my parents live. And so what happened is all of our boats, all of our men's boats were anchored out in these big southeast storms, the very first storms hit in the winter. And these boats were getting flooded, taken out to sea, they were washing up ashore. It was devastation the very first winter. So the Heshkwa people, they began to get really angry. They began to get angry because they weren't able to, uh, they weren't able to meet Canada's strict criteria for um, using resources from the ocean that they have for thousands of years. So they wrote a letter to the federal government of Canada explaining these issues. And so at the time they looked at a map and they took away one of our reserves called Ayasuk, where my parents live now, which ironically, translates to place of many fishing weirs. They took that, they just basically erased it and they said, all right, we're gonna put you in this place. It's called Refuge Cove. You all know where it is. You can anchor your boats out 365 days of the year. Our hash group people said, all right, all right, let's do it. And they were correct on that. To this day, lots of boats go into Hot Spring Refuge Cove to hide from the big storms. So that reserve was at the head of the bay. As you can see, there's nothing there. And I want to remind people that prior to this was the creation of the reserve system. So the Heshkwit people had been living in these territories for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And smallpox and measles hit, we had very few people. And then we were placed on these small plots of land known as the reserve which we could only leave in and out of with a signed note from the Indian agent. The Indian agent didn't know how to say our names. Kinkwashtakumt was far too difficult for an Indian agent to say. So they said, all right, Charleston. That's how our names got taken away from us. So when we look, begin to look at this history as a Heshkwit individual, we don't have very much trust in the government. They put us on these little reserves and they took our names away and they governed us and they took us away from our families and they sent us to those schools. Not very much faith in the government, not very much faith in the RCMP. They came and they arrested my grandmother because she didn't want to send my dad to school. All those stories are real. So I'm trying to draw a picture here. And the reason why there's no houses or anything in the bay there where I said the initial reserve was, is because in 1964, there was a massive tidal wave. So I used to ask my father about that tidal wave. And finally, he answered once and he said, I don't know about the tidal wave because I wasn't there. And I said, well, where were you? He said, I was at Christie Indian Residential School. So he, really, he was a child and he didn't know that he actually had no home to return to. The entire community was devastated from the uh, tsunami in 1964. So we were removed from our territories, placed onto the reserve. We were removed from that reserve and placed out of our traditional territory in the traditional territory of the Ahauze. And then in 1964, we were removed again and then finally in the 70s, our people started moving back, my father's generation. And they moved back on the side of the hill there. And they, 
in the case that there's another tsunami. So I'm trying to draw that image of, of the impacts of colonization and how it has impacted our views on just society as a whole. So I'll continue with my presentation and I'm gonna share some of the impacts. And I apologize, I didn't put a lot on the screen. I just kind of whipped up my presentation, but the impacts are real. And the impacts I wanna speak about are, are overrepresentation. So as indigenous people, we are way overrepresented in things like children and care. Despite only representing roughly 7% of the population in Canada, we represent close to 50% of all children in care. Incarceration rates. The adult population in all of Canada, if you're indigenous, we're nine times more likely to be incarcerated. We're overrepresented provincially and federally for men and women in custody, as well as youth. Homelessness rates. The opioid overdose crisis. We only make up 3.3% 3 of the population here in BC as First Nations people, but we make up 16% of the opioid deaths. This is reality and these are impacts of those historical traumas I spoke about. Suicide rates, five to seven times higher for First Nations youth than non-First Nations youth in Canada. In Inuit, some of the highest suicide rates in the entire world at 11 times the rate these are all the impacts, they're real. And I had to mention them. So we're shining light on truth. That's something that I really tried to do today is shine the light on truth and understanding the importance of it in moving forward in a good way. And that a big part of that truth is acknowledging the territory you're on and seeking to learn and seeking to connect with people from that territory and building that community and relationship. We're not going to talk about reconciliation yet because we'll see if there's time. And oops, I didn't put that. So moving forward, I want to share this analogy with you folks about tools I think that would help in decolonizing the space around us. And it starts with acknowledging the power in the land that you're on that you'll notice that it's become a big thing. People do acknowledge the territory, but I mean truly acknowledge the territory and giving back. And one really um, powerful analogy that I learned from my father as a child in doing things in the right way is that when you imagine the Heshkwit Hahufli, the Heshkwit territory, I want you to think of it as a house. How would you feel when you're going into somebody's house? If I was going to visit Torrance, would I just kind of stop by middle of the night banging on his door, even though I know he has a youngster at home? Would I just, you know, would I do these crazy things? Would I just go into Torrance's house without him there and just checking out what you got for food, Torrance, like digging your style, start cooking up in his kitchen, leave a big mess, maybe invite some of my friends, have a big, big party. I want people to think of that analogy that we've lived and survived on these lands for so long. I want you to picture that my friend Micah, who's no longer with us, but him six foot, a big tall guy standing there with a big long thread of beads, explaining his connection to this earth right here. That's how long our people have been here and survived here. So I want people to think of that analogy when they want to do business in Tlaoquiet, when they want to do business in Euclid, Heshkwit, anywhere it is, Esquimaltz, Nanemwachs, Nanawas, anywhere it is to think of that analogy and how you would go about it if you were going to visit somebody's house and to go about it in that same type of way because our, uh, our refrigerator is the ocean. Our refrigerator is everything around us. Our medicines, is a, it's all surrounded, surrounding us and intertwined with us. So I really wanted to draw that image and um, express how the government has done a really good job disconnecting our people from our territory. As a Heshkwit woman, uh, we have about roughly 800 members and over 90% of our people live away from home. So because of all of those factors that I had mentioned before, and 
if you're going to enter territory, I suggest you do it in that same sense, in that same analogy I had brought up. And I wanted to remind people as well that uh, I went and participated in ceremony on May 5th at Sutton Pass in Plaukwi at Hahuthli. And right on the sign there, it says that come back when it's safe. So they're not welcoming visitors right now. That's a part of being respectful is um, seeing things like that and understanding. So that's the end of my presentation. I won't hold up or take any more time. Tleko, tleko, and I will be happy to answer any questions. I think, yeah, tleko, tleko, chu. Thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, that was, that was fantastic. Um, lots of us, I imagine, on this call have been uh, to Heshkwit territory or the territories uh, around it. And, um, you know, the way that it's, the way that it's often marketed in tourism, you know, it's wild, there's beaches, there's hot springs, there's kayaking. Um, and that history, uh, you know, it, 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 it wouldn't look good on a tourism commercial, but it's part of it. And so to acknowledge that and to, and to ground our understanding in that is, is really important. So thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Um, our next speaker is Kwastenahan. Jared Williams is the Cowichan Tribes Elders Kitchen Manager, a writer for the Discourse Cowichan, uh, and a traditional foods advocate and father uh, from Cowichan. Uh, he's a source of knowledge on Facebook, and, uh, and I'm sure he's got some more knowledge for all of us uh, tonight. Take it away, Jared. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. Well, hi, Chrisiam. Nanu, I can listen to you all day. Oh, hi, Chris. So, I see you see a see you have 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 um ni um Jane um Costanlewood Wesley ni um Earl um Awatet de Walmos ni Williams itana um Samana Khatsa itana um um Sila itana obtain ni um Adriana Williams itana um um, Europe, all over the place. Ietana, um, Masila, uh, Hendrik, a Roland, a Van, um, a Bernachian at to, um, Holland. Um, so, oh, hi, Tapka, see you So that's who I am. In a nutshell, very small, tiny nutshell, um, the elders would be mad and say, You only went back like two, like, generations. You're being lazy. And all people here are thinking, gee, is he just going to ramble like that all night? I want to hear what he has to say. I can remember being young and actually hanging out in, you know, like, you know, you know, like the longhouse. And we didn't really use, you know, like the language at home. So I'd always be asking, what? Oh, what are they saying, auntie? What's he saying? And she say, shut up and listen. You'll, you'll learn if you listen. If he always has to, you know, translate for you, you won't learn nothing. But I'll be nice. I'll translate. Hello, my... Uh, friends and relatives, I am uh, Jared Williams. My traditional name is Makus, 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 Makus Denehan. My uh, dad's um, mom is from um, the Nanaimo Reserve. Her name was um, Jane Wesley. My um, dad's dad is from the um, Tsamanat Reservation here in um, Chikwatsin. And his name was Earl Williams. And my um, mom's um, mom is from the highlands of um, Scotland. Yet, yeah, you know, like she lived everywhere all over Europe. And my mom's dad, um, Hendrik, is from um, Holland. And so they would want me to head all the way back to like their moms and dads and preferably even their moms and dads and then try to explain to you why I have this you know like name one thing that is you know like real with us is I don't have a name I don't even um I don't technically own like like anything I don't you know you know I don't own land 
I don't own a house. I don't own my own like name. I wear a name. That's what we say in our language. We wear this name. This name ain't mine. This name is old. This name goes back. And so when, you know, you know, like elders ask me, you know, like to introduce myself, you have to say, okay, well, this name is from, you know, like my auntie and it's from like her mom and her mom's, you know, dad used to wear it and her dad's like dad wore it. And when I, um, I run out about um, seven, you know, like generations, because that's when we change to just like the Indian, uh, uh, you know, names, right? Like, you know, like I can, my um, grandma's grandpa was named Albert Wesley, but the man who wore the name like, like prior to him had no like English like name. So I'm not able to say on oh, his dad, you know, you know, like, uh, and, you know, like, use a name. No, because he is Kwastenacha. He was, you know, the original. So we have to know these things. It's always, you know, really um, like interesting to me because, yeah, we have like um, 20 minutes and I, I could probably use that on just, you know, like who I was alone. So um, decolonizing outdoor spaces, I don't have any um, fancy, um, you, know, you, know, you know, like shots or nothing. So, um, you know, that was awesome. But what I... I want to try to do is um, talk about the way things like really, you know, were and like the way things are. One of them is that, okay, in yesteryear when there were Awateta, Sikwanitam, um, when there were only, you know, Aboriginal individuals here, which was really only about 200 years ago because we were only really hit with a lot of Europeans in like the like, like 1860s. But I know it's probably not a really big shock to anybody here, but we lived here for a long time and there were lots of us. And so there is a really big like history with like, you know, uh, like romance and war and like all these other things that used to happen here all the time. Just like over there, it also happened over here. But what's really weird to most of us is we don't think about it. When we think about, I want to learn about history. You, you know, I was probably 21. I'm like, you know, like, I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to learn about history. I know my own history, but I'm running away to Europe to be like, look at these things that are old. It's here. And, you know, the older I am, the more I realize that it's all over the island, all the islands. If you have any idea, we live in a world that is, I think, would be substantially um, cooler than um, Europe because you're in the woods. If you've ever had to go to Europe, you're never in the woods. There's no woods left there. They already got rid of all those woods. So if you're here and you're in the woods, you know, like you're actually doing pretty good. The only big issue with any of that nonsense is the fact that most of our relics are either um, legends or rocks. And believe me, you know, like rocks are, you know, like um, not really awesome, but they're way like more like awesome when they're linked with like legends. So what happened? Why do you think we don't really um, talk about the history here? What is it, right? Okay, yeah, like, you, you know, there were, you know, the realities about like the disease hitting and like the 90% uh, of, you know, like population being, you know, axed when, you have to remember there's no you know like youtube like okay if you know half of you know like vancouver you know or if, if um you know like uh, um 90 percent of like vancouver um you know disappeared everybody would just you know be oh, okay how do i do this online i'll just go look it up there is no youtube back then it was all verbal if you knew anything, it was because your like ancestors, that's what like they knew. The only technological advancement was like a like uh, like uh, like generational. You were like, wow, this is great. I'm gonna let everybody know. That's it. It's not like, oh, okay, I just you know, you know, blah blah, blah online and everybody knows all around the world. We, uh, uh, you know within half an hour. No. And so, therefore, um, something that is, is odd to a lot of us is the, the, the European desire and, and um, a feeling of the right of access to having all of the information, right? 
as yeah, you know, half, you know, like European, I love the library. I walk around the library all the time. I can read whatever I want. I can know anything. I can, you know, like hop on YouTube. Like I said, I can know anything right now. Bam. Not if I go ask you, uh, you, uh, you know, elders, right. You know, like their elders say, ah, Sean, that's not for you. You don't, you know, like you don't even know that. I'll be like, Andy, I just want to know about, you know, this, uh, 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 you know, herb. You're a chef. You're not a medicine man. Don't act like no freaking blah, blah. You know, come on now, go on. We're not even allowed to ask these things. You know, like sometimes when we ask the wrong question, we get in big trouble. So imagine a world where you're only handed, you know, like information that you like require, right? Everybody, uh, you know, has a job and everybody has, you know, that information. And then there's only one out of every like 10 people and there's no YouTube. It's, it's like, I, I like to refer to it as um, like the Aboriginal, like Armageddon, because that's what it was. We don't really use, you know, that word. We think, oh, no, that's the end of the world. It was the end of the world. <laughs> the world ended. <laughs> it's over. So what happened then? Okay. So that was then. Right. And then like, Oh, what happened now? Um, the Europeans arrived and as like they do, um, they colonize and, you know, that's okay. Right. It's, you know, I'm half, you know, like European too. And, you know, everybody likes to, to try, you know, you know, like, you know, like to hate on them, but you know, that's okay. They arrived. And what's really interesting to me, <laughs> is that, you know, they be in, you know, like their, uh, 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 you know, like boat and, you know, be like, oh, oh, uh, you look at that island. Everybody in the boat, yeah, look at that island. He says, you know, I like you. Uh, what's your name? He says, um, I'm um, Willie, sir. He goes, great. That's going to be called Willie's Island. I'd like you to write it down right now. That's going to be called Willie's Island. That's after you, man. That's your island. And they just keep on, you know, like up the. That's not Willie's Island. That was Chlelt for like 10,000 years until he come up and said it was called Willie's Island. But every island, every hill, every river, every valley, every mountain has a name. <laughs> and they've all been renamed. And that is just blows my mind. So why would we do that? Well, because we don't really know how to pronounce our language. And you know what? We're not even going to try because we, even when the Europeans arrived, there was this, this, uh, this idea, I'd say probably uh, within the late like 1800s, early like 1900s that we would all just actually like die off. Um, we were a tribe of, we were the largest um, tribe within um, the province in um, the heavily, um, the most heavily like populated, um, uh, um, like area within um, the province. And we went from what they, um, I thought was about, um, 10 to 12, like thousand to like 300 people, um, in uh, the late, 1800s we had all the way down to like like 300 people and we're up to um 5,000 but it's you know it's been a long time um but so what do you do right you think okay well you know a woe is the Indian he's on his way out the door so we don't need to look at him anymore we're just going to do what we do and that's what they did right they they went around they said well they don't use this land no more I'm going to use it and okay sure whatever but one thing that really like you know like um, riles me up is that they like renamed everything and what happens then is now you and me and all these you know like wonderful individuals that are here with us we don't know where we live we got this weird idea that we live in Europe because we eat um, European food. We live by European laws and we live on European land with European names. But that's not where we live, right? Like <laughs> never did we live there. We live on um, top of the, you know, like the real, you know, you know, land. It's almost, you know, like virtual, you know, like reality. You know, everybody walks around the woods like, oh, no one's ever walked in these woods before. I'm up this mountain. I've never seen nobody here. We live there. We walk there. We, you know, for a long time, we walked on everywhere on this island. 
every rock, every tree, we were there. That was ours. It was awesome. But it ain't no more. And what's hard for me is when, you know, like my son says to me, hey, dad, why does the teacher keep trying to tell me it's called Mount um, uh, Provo? I said, oh, because that's what like, you know, like, the, you know, like the English, that's what, you know, they um, they use. And he goes, but when I try to tell her it's called uh, uh, Maswakas, you know, like, you know, like she gets mad. And so I have to go in and say to her, okay, hell, oh, hi, I have no idea who you are, but this is the real name of the mountain. So if you ever hear it, you know, here's up on the board, S-W-U-Q-U-S, you know, here's all the history, the blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm leaving. You know, that's your job now. Why didn't that happen 20, 100 years ago? Like, um, so, okay, wait, now, why does that matter? Okay, yes, you know, having a name is awesome. Linking to, like, where you live is awesome so that, you know, all of... Uh, you just heard um, like our, uh, you know, like the incarceration rates, the alcoholism rates, like opioid rates, the uh, like suicide, like rates, like I got, you know, like, uh, um, like, uh, uh, like funerals all the time of, you know, uh, like young people that, you know, I was with, you know, <laughs> and that's rough. <laughs> and so why? Right. We're not, you know, like linked here. You know, we don't like see our own like language on, you know, like the land. Right. So that's really hard for us. So that's one aspect of it. What's the other aspect? What I think is hilarious is in a lot of like the English like language and, and like European like languages, there's a lot of um, 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 possessives. Right. You, you know, like you would like say things like. Um, um, a Mount um, a Provo, because, you know, there was um, like um, um, Admiral um, James uh, um, Provo, he had, a, you know, like an island, you know, that was all the way named after him and a mountain and I think a river somewhere. And, but who, like, who, who was this guy? Okay, so why did he get to name it? Why did, so, okay, but why did we have that as a name? Okay. Interesting, right? If you knew why we named it uh, 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 Maswakas, you would know so much about us. So in uh, the beginning, the ancestors, they landed on that um, Melik mountain, you know, like, you know, like it's, you know, what, you know, like legends happen to say, you know, they landed there. So there were two ancestors. Um, Stutzen and um, Sialitsa, and uh, they lived there. And um, Sialitsa left, but um, Stutzen, you know, like he was there. And he walked on the mountain and he was lonely and all day saying, Oh, I need a friend. Oh, send me a friend. And, uh, one day he's walking on the mountain and he sees. Uh, um, a cave and on you know like the inside of it there's um like a dog and um the dog you know he's like oh yay it's my friend and they like run around and, and you know within a lot of our uh, legends you know there's um Stutzen and his um, dog, um, Swakas. And, you know, they do all these other things and all these other legends. But when Swakas um, dies, um, Stutzen, he actually walks all the way to the top of the mountain, you know, holding this old ugly dog all the way to the top. And he has to get a big hole in between because there's, you know, these like, uh, like two humps on, you know, the top of the mountain. So um, right in between those humps, is where um, the dog is. I think to yourself, you know, that's interesting, but you just learned our creation story because you had to know about the name of a mountain. What if I told you about the name of a lake or the name of an island or the name of a river or the name of a village? Like your mind would just blow up because you would have to learn all about who I was just to know where you lived. And that, <laughs> that is, you know, what really 
trying to decolonize these, you know, like like outdoor uh, uh, places is, you know, it's all about like the reality that I like to paddle out to Maple Bay used to be named uh, Huitlapanates. And so Huitlapanates in uh, the late, you know, like eight or no, the early 1800s, there was a war there between um, what we call the Yahuas, Yahuas um, Tet, which is um, some of the, you know, like Northern tribes. You know, like if you're on here, it's okay now. I don't want to argue with you right now. But there was a big war between us for probably about 2000 years. And it like resulted in this giant like battle, which if you were to hop online now, you could probably read up on what they call the uh, um, battle of like, like Maple Bay. And anyway, there were hundreds, if not thousands of um, canoes that were like involved in it. And it's this huge, uh, you know, thing, but what I like is that now when I'm out on the bay, I have this wonderful like ability to re um, 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 visit that like story about what like happened there. You know, you can like read up on it and then, uh, uh, you know, you're out in the water and you can see where they would have been. Raided um, you know, from very you know, like line of uh, canoes, you know, like would have uh, uh, you know attacked, and in you know the end of it, the uh, um, our um, tribe um, threw you know like large rocks off of these really high um, cliffs, you know, like onto uh, you know the enemy, and you can actually um, you know like um, see you know, like the really high rocks and all the rocks in the water and think to yourself, wow, I wonder if those rocks are the ones they were throwing off. You don't have to go to Rome, you know, to, you know, to, you know, like see that you just have to go to Maple Bay and all of our like place names have that. Like um, I'm already about, uh, you know, like a minute over, but I just, I want to say that looking into where we are will really help you to understand where you are, because we don't have to leave here to have history. We don't have to leave here to learn. We don't have to leave here to try to, um, you know, uh, um, find ourselves, you know, like we're all here together. So we have to learn exactly like uh, um, where we are. So, oh, hi, Zap, I see the CIA for that. and. I will hand it over to the next individual in line. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for that, Jared. Um, yeah, I think the way that we, the way that we kind of ask and give directions, uh, you know, for, for non-Indigenous people, and it's always like intersections, like, oh, you know, that street and that where it crosses that street, I'm like two blocks down, you know, and and it's all fast like that. And and in working with, with communities and on the territories of nations, you know, uh, building a bit more time and space for those conversations about about uh, what the places are not just not just what they're called um, I really appreciate that uh, that perspective um, our final speaker tonight is uh, is Giselle Maria Martin who's a tribal parks guardian uh, from the colloquia nation I've learned a lot from Giselle uh, over the years doing work on on her nation's territory and I'm grateful to have them here with us tonight uh, Giselle go ahead Tuna ata hits Johnny, who classes to oak his doctors to oak quiet, he's a pustus mahti ear was it. Tlaya who are suhit, a doctor massa suhit, who are to Bahku, ha hoopa, ha hoopa, a key Jared, a at Maria. Um, I come from the house of Ehoset from to oak quiet. And um, the name I wear is Tlauk. It's one of my great, great, great grandmother's name who um, she followed her intuition. She knew something very bad was gonna happen and uh, directed our family to isolate ourselves. And that's why we survived the smallpox epidemics. We went from 
population of over 10,000 people down to 122. That epidemic, I believe, is still going on right now. You know, we talk about the current pandemic, but it, to me, it's all the same pandemic, and it has to do with colonialism and the enslavement of animals and the enslavement of nature. Um, but getting sidetracked already. Um, I, I am a learner, I'm learning language, and uh, there's a word that I learned from Grandpa Levi, it's Yud's Hapisoth, and it's said in a prayer when we go into another nation's territory. Yud's Hapisoth, Tama Tuxin Hapisoth. Yud's Hapisoth is one word, but it means let us walk slowly, carefully, with dignity, honor, respect, and humility. And it's saying, for as long as it is I that is walking upon this land, which is their home. And we have had international trade here for thousands of years. Like there's tourists that come from all over the world to this place and they write in the sand outside my house, they write Tofino and I go and I erase it because I'm like, this is not Tofino, this is Tlaukwet. We're not even in the district of Tofino. But anyways, um, you know, we have had international visitors long before these tourists came. And when visitors come through our territories, it's custom that they would sing their paddle songs to announce who they are and that they're coming in peace with good intentions. And they would first come to our villages, just like when you go to your friend's house, you know, you go to their front door first. Um, Mariah was talking about being a good guest in somebody's home. Same thing. We, they wouldn't just come into our territory and then go willy nilly out into the inlet and start rummaging through our clam garden or who knows what. They'd come to our front door first. So they arrive in front of the village. They don't touch the beach yet. They announce who they are. They ask for permission to land. We have people whose roles it is, like the beach keeper, to welcome them on behalf of our hatwe, our hereditary chiefs who have responsibility of the hahuthi. And when our guests are welcomed ashore, when we say Tlaya Hu'ath, happy to see you, that welcome, Tlaya Hu'ath, comes with the understanding that our guests will uh, behave respectfully and in accordance to our laws while they're in our territory. And when they land, when they're finally permitted to land, um, one of the things that was very obvious were the totem poles and the crests, which were painted and decorated all of the big long houses that we lived in, all of the totem poles in front of the houses, um, which today many of those have been taken away. Um, I have a little photo here. These are um, two poles that my late grandfather put up. And one is a memorial and one is about our constitution. These poles are not just pretty things to look at. They are about our laws. Um, today we have a writing system, like I have my list there, you know, wash my clothes, uh, clean up my house, <laughs> stuff on my wall there in our language. We have a IPA, like an international phonetic alphabet that we use now, which the letters reflect individual sounds in our language. And that's really helpful for texting. But I've been told my whole life, like, oh, we have an oral history. Yes, we do. But this here, this is a semasiographic writing system. Semasiographic, there are symbols and crests that relay information. And these crests are owned by families and they represent the laws that we uphold and that we live by. Um, so it's different from a glottographic writing system, which is behind me. So up here, one of the laws, you know, that that our families upheld is Esoc, and it's upheld and it's represented here by the moon. And Esoc is one um, that is shared by many nations. It's one of our most important laws. Esoc is a new channel's word, and um, it it has often translated as meaning respect, but it is a verb, and it is the process of being observant appreciating and acting accordingly. And when we're a being observant, it's not just watching with our eyes and ears and taking notes and data down. It's listening with our hearts and with our guts and our intuition. There's no hierarchy of logic and intuition. Both are very important. We have to use all of it. 
So the reason that Isak is, um, you know, we see that teaching in association with the moon, the hupas, uh, the, is because we live on a planet. We live on a planet. We are governed by universal laws. We are governed by the stars, the sun, the moon, the planets. Um, it's important for us to not only do the right things, but we have to do the right things at the right time. We need to be observant of the tides, the seasons, the weather. Um, you know, when you go talk to your friend and you've got real happy news, are you just going to blurt it out if they look really sad and, and heartbroken? Like it's not the right time. If you're wanting to go hunting and the animals that you want to hunt are pregnant, it's not the right time. It's against our law to hunt pregnant animals. If you're hunting a deer and uh, there happens to be wolves hunting that same deer, back off, give them right of way. It's against our laws to hunt or ever hurt or interfere with wolves. They have the right of way. They are integral in maintaining the balance of nature in our territories, at least. Um, so there's a lot of laws and these laws, uh, these poles and these crests, are also reflected in the songs and the dances that our families have, which come from the Hahuthi. Hahuthi is another new Chonoth word. And Hahuthi is often um, translated as a chief's traditional territory. But a lot of things are lost in translation, and English is um, very ecologically illiterate language. So a lot of things get lost. Hahuthi, as I've been learning our language more, is not just a chief's traditional territory. It is a living place that has provided us our songs, our names, our medicines, our dances. It is also the intergenerational relationship that we have with place um, and with all of the biological diversity within it. Uh, it's more like a marriage with a living being than a sense of private ownership of a thing that we would have this human supremacy idea of th that we can conquer and use up and destroy. Human supremacy is not something that was part of our culture. We are part of the family of life um, and we have very important roles and responsibilities within it, but so do all the other plants and animals and the rocks, the air, the wind. So that's why there's also a, a poish in here, a raven, and they are showing that all of life. Um, so the care of Hahuthi is something that's very important. And you know, today um, people often say like, oh, humans suck. We're destroying the world. Humans are horrible. Uh, oh, that, give, that's human culture for you. Uh, actually, it's not. Um, I did subscribe to that idea some years back, over a decade back, and I joined the voluntary human extinction movement. I was so discouraged about how humans are behaving in the world today. But um, as I've been learning, uh, I was also asked to go and represent Tlokwe tribal parks at an international conference in Spain. And I ended up on a panel with nine indigenous men from around the world from completely different cultures. And uh, you know, there's somebody from the Sahara Desert, there's somebody from Africa, there's people from Papua New Guinea, Hawaii. We all were given five minutes to talk about what wilderness meant to us because it was a, a Wild 10 Congress uh, conference. Only five minutes. And um, I had gone prepared to say, you know, that our language is very different. Our understanding and our connection to land and water and air here is very different. And uh, when the local uh, Parks Canada Reserve wanted to translate some signs, they wanted uh, a word for the word wilderness. And maybe they thought that, oh, there's going to be lots of words for wilderness. There's lots of it all over the place. Maybe there'll be so many words, just like we heard that there's many words for snow in Inuit, right? So it's all over. There's going to be lots of wilderness. Well, they had a group of elders here working on it, and they met and they debated. Well, they didn't debate. They discussed this for three days. And when they came back, they said, the closest word we have for wilderness is wasu. 
And that means home. There's no such thing as wilderness. It doesn't exist. And um, yeah, if you Google the definition of wilderness, it is a wild place that humans might visit, but they do not live there. It is a wild, maybe a desolate wasteland. Humans do not garden there. They don't farm there. They don't take care of it. They might visit. That's it. That's wilderness. So according to that term and that definition that you can find on, on Google, um, there's no wilderness here. It does not exist. And also, there's no wilderness anywhere else that I have been on this continent. Very fortunate that in a lot of my travels, especially in recent years, I've had the privilege of meeting other indigenous elders and culture keepers. There's no wilderness there either. You know, Sierra Nevada, big wilderness zones, desert, sage, so beautiful. I love it. Wow, cool, I'm going in the wilderness. <laughs> nope. I met Paiute elders from there, and one man, uh, especially, I got to talk with him till late at night, sitting in the dark. He has spent his life mapping out uh, Indian irrigation ditches where they irrigated the entire valley, the entire valley of Sierra Nevada, and they helped to bring life to it, more life for birds, for deer, for everybody, not just the humans, for everybody. And that water has been stolen away to LA for over 100 years now. So what we see when we go there, we say, oh, the wilderness. It doesn't look anything like it used to. Um, and that's the same for most of our territories, you know, like people come to Tofino and there's a stereotype that uh, you want to live in a cabin and have a dog and go surfing. And it's so great because you're going to let your dog run free on the beach and everything's awesome. There's no rules. We had very strict rules of care, reciprocity, responsibility within every ha Houthi that every family is connected to. There are integral ecological roles which are in place. Many have been disrupted. Um, every area of forest had names, just like there's names for different districts of a city today every area of the forest not a wilderness it's an ancestral garden uh, every stream had a river guardian associated with it every part of the forest had a forest guardian associated with it there were people who took care of the estuaries of the intertidal zones of the seaweed gardens there's people who took care of the fish traps there's people who took care of the offshore fishing banks and way offshore here, the whale hunting grounds going out, you know, 40 miles offshore. And all of these people would meet together and especially during our potlatch ceremonies, which were outlawed by the government. Um, those songs and dances reflected the caretaking of those spaces as well and the teachings that we received from those beings and places. times like hey this river is something is going on we've noticed this year and this happened five years this year we need to not take any salmon or this year we can take 500,000 salmon or this year we should only take 500 you know so it was very very carefully regulated the river guardians who took care of the rivers didn't just uh, regulate how much salmon. They also um, took care of the salmon in the streams year round. When the pipichquin, the little baby salmon are hatched, they don't go to the ocean right away. They spend the first year of their life in some of these tiny streams far inland in the, in the forest. And um, if there's a big drought, the forest guardians and the river guardians knew exactly where they might get stuck in pools. And they had special bent wood boxes to move them to different parts of the same river for optimal survival. We know on the coast here now, you know, scientists have come around going, why are the trees so big? Why is the forest so lush? And they found that 80% of the nitrogen in the trees is sea nitrogen. It comes directly from the salmon. It's carried into the forest by bears and wolves and feeds over 50 species of insects. And then the songbird population every year reflects how many salmon came home to every river system you know, the year before. Um, would you think of all that? And the role that these river guardians had, it's a huge impact. 
you know, we've heard these stories that there were so many salmon in some of the rivers that people could walk across without getting their feet wet. And they've been annihilated. Um, so that's just one thing, but you know, when we look at the plants and the animals and the land, there's a lot of talk today about every national park, there's a plant walk somewhere, there's somebody who's It'll have a book, a page, a, a picture of the plant, and then a But that's not in line with our culture either here. Every use is enshrined in care, responsibility, reciprocity. And um, so, you know, we've had school groups come and go, hey, can you add some cultural information to like our sand dune project or whatever? Some of the activity is getting the kids to run around and ID plants as fast as possible and write their lists and their names in Latin on a list and then woo, they win a prize. Um, I was like, no, 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 actually, you know what? Let's like tear up these Latin names, get rid of them. No, they're not gonna run around the sand dunes and crush more uh, sensitive endangered plants. Let's get everyone to split up and go sit quietly with a plant for 20 minutes. Go sit with it. Go sit with them. And uh, let's see what we learn. You know, who are those plants interacting with? What insects are coming around? How do you feel? Is it fuzzy? Who knows? And that's another thing, you know, with with um, our language and the connection to the land. Um, learning language is one of the most, it's really the most meaningful thing that I've ever done in my life. I grew up speaking French and English, um, but learning our language completely has changed my life. Um, it is an ecologically based language and every day it gives me something new. Lately, it's the concept of ish. Uh, so there's a lot of talk today about pronouns, you know, transgender people, and I want to support them. Um, and so there's pronouns of he, she, and it in English, and people are going by they. I'm trying it out as well. Um, but I realized in our own language, there is no he, she, and it. It's all ish. And so there's a lot of talk about the sexism and racism, but it's all in this human bubble. And, you know, he, she, and it, that's a hierarchy. People have an animal. Most animals usually go by it. But once they're loved and given a human name, yo, oh, that's the dog. They, he's a he now. He's hungry. He's happy. He's wagging his tail. Oh, but if it's a wild animal, it's an it. They're not a they anymore. It's an it. So our pets have a hierarchy and they get to chase birds that are exhausted that are trying to travel across the entire globe and they only have a few minutes to stop and rest and eat and the dogs get to chase them because they are they and the birds aren't it so uh, i've been trying to practice saying they and skip out uh you, whenever i say it to say they and refer to plants as they in english and animals as they and even the rivers, the water, the air, the wind, um, the rocks, which I know for some people, that's pushing it way far, but it's a they. They they are a they in our language. Um, so I'm still learning and I'm a lifelong learner. I know I'm making mistakes and I don't know what I'll look back on, but um, I like to, Put it in this perspective that's given me some relief in the last couple of years and that is that when we think of early contact you know that's back in 1778 when captain cook got lost in the fog and would have died if he hadn't been found by the friendly moachet people who took him into their village um or uh that awful person columbus 
uh, early contact. So when we think of early contact, it seems really far away. But actually, when we look at the time span of thousands and thousands of years of history, which is what's encoded in here, um, Canada is only 153 years old, 154. It's still early contact right now as we speak. Yeah, maybe there was first contact, but this is early contact. And that's why things are so chaotic. That's why we have a lot of things to learn every day. Things are changing rapidly. So, you know, there's the Wilderness Committee. I want to thank you for putting this together. And I'm aware that it's the Wilderness Committee and the word wilderness is in it, you know? And like, it, there's, I used to say wilderness too. Like, just like 10 years ago, I called things wilderness when I was a wilderness guide. I've taken that out of my language. Um, and I don't know what else I'll take out of my language in the coming days, but everything's changing. Um, I want to thank Mariah too for covering some of, uh, you know, the heavy effects of colonialism. I've been teaching uh, the New Channels Lands and Waters Ambassador course for some years, and it's like a three or four hour course, but a third of it is taken up with just explaining colonialism, which is really heavy duty. And I've recently just had this reaction like, why do I have to teach this? This is not New Channels. This is not New Channels Lands and Waters. This is Canada. This is Canadian history. I shouldn't have to teach this at all. And so, you know, I really want to ask the educators out there, like, bring it out, talk about it, don't be shy about it. Yes, we'll make mistakes, um, but we need to do that. We need to bring those out. And we cannot leave it up to just Indigenous people to shoulder the burden of education around these things. We have a beautiful culture to uphold. We have names and songs and dances. We have history. Uh, we have a whole different approach about how to be in a relationship with these places. And if our time is taken up with talking about colonialism, you know, it's we're really missing out as well. So do the work wherever you can, whenever you can. Um, late Mary Hayes uh, is an elder. I used to go visit when I was a teenager and um, she, I used to ask her questions and she taught me a lot. I feel really lucky now to have done that. Sometimes I'd go visit her and uh, she didn't know the answers to my questions. And um, I got really discouraged and she said, don't worry, as long as we can protect the plants and the animals and the spirit of the places, we can relearn directly from them because that's where we're from. That's where our culture comes from. I didn't really understand, but I guess I, I mean, I became a little bit of an environmentalist though. Now I'm more of an environmentalist. I'm an enviro-guttalist. <laughs> like it's, it's my blood, it's in my blood. It's not, it's, you know, I didn't set out to be an activist. I'm just trying to live. I just want to continue practicing our culture. But now that I've started learning our language more, I really see what she said come to life. Because though these things, these teachings and laws are encoded in our totem poles, and yes, many of our totem poles have been stolen away. They're in museums in Chicago and who knows where else, right? They've been stolen away. And yes, our village has been cannonballed and burnt to the ground. And I cannot find an original photograph of our village as it was before it was destroyed. And that's sad. Ultimately, all of these crests, they are from this place. They are from this land. And these crests are really encoded in the land. So really our laws, our constitution, our teachings are encoded in the land and the plants and animals, um, you know, they, the onomatopoeias, the sounds of this place have become our language and they're exemplified by all the living beings. So it's just really, really cool. And like, like Jared mentioned too, like the names, the place names, they are epic and they're worth having and presenting. And 
I want to refrain from the word sharing when I talk about songs, dances, or even names, because that can lend itself to appropriation. So I want to say more like presenting. Um, but I, it's really worth talking about, and it needs visibility. I think I'll stop there. I lost track of time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Giselle. Um, I appreciate the uh, the deconstruction of terms like wilderness that that we name environmental groups after, and then and then have you know include in our language and 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 when they don't really have much meaning in in this context in this part of the world. Um, all, all three of your perspectives were really uh, powerful and, and really important and, and a lot of food for thought. And I'm wondering if, uh, if folks who are participating have, have immediate questions uh, out of there's a lot to kind of sit with and reflect on. Um, are there questions from the, uh, from the audience? If so, there's the Q&A. There's also the chat um, function down along the bottom. Um, we've got some time uh, for questions for one of or all of the, uh, the panelists. Uh, Tonight. So I'll turn that over to uh, to Emily. I think is there a couple already, Em? Yep, there's at least one right here that I can read out. So this question is from Cassandra, and she says, "How can we learn more of the history and names of the places we visit and live? I have searched online, but sometimes it's difficult to find the true names of places, mountains, etc. But I would really like to use the old names." Are there maps with the right names or websites websites we can refer to? So whoever wants to tackle that question, go ahead. Um, I can just hop in right there. So at least where I live, we have maps that we have actually um, like shared. It's not the issue of having a map. It's how do you read a language you can't read? Um, <clears throat> so, one aspect of it is yes, if you live in uh, between um, Shemanus and like Malahat, in which is you know the uh, the edges of our uh, um, like nation, uh, we have maps. You just have to um, uh, Google um, Hulkamitnam um, uh, place names, and there'll be lots. There's lots. Uh, I'm not sure what happens with everybody else. Um, but there is this wonderful website called um, First um, uh, Voices, and um, they have a lot of um, content around um, using our language, all of our languages. There's lots of other languages on there, too, within, um, you know, the area. It's not only our, like, Hulkamitnam language. And... Um, I'm not sure if there's Hulkamitnam um, names on there, but there are um, the maps. And so, you know, this is where we walk on that other line where we want to watch out for trying to, you know, like appropriate. So um, could I type a website? Yeah, oh, awesome, there it is. Um, as an example, um, a lot of individuals ask me for words so they can have, you know, like a name on you know they're like signed you know they want to open up a, a restaurant and they want it to be named this and so how do you you know write that well a yeah we don't always have words we can translate it to and you know like b um are are you are you like native bro <laughs> if you are awesome if you're not maybe you should use a really awesome not aboriginal name um uh, but if, let's say, you run um, 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 a facility that uses, you know, like um, traditional, you know, lands and you would like, to, you know, like to know about history, there are lots of um, lore books. If you if you like really um, look around, there's usually one or two or three, um, you know, like, you know, you know, like, um, like, or more um, uh, books where either like anthropologists, you know, like recorded things, or um, uh, journalists in, you know, like the beginning of all this, like within our valley, there's, you know, like a book called um, Two Houses Half um, Buried in, you know, like Sand, and there's um, like another book called uh, um, Dare of the Ghost. And so they have um, a lot of that information 
uh, you know, within them, like why these things are, you know, you know, you know, like named, you know, like what they're named. And so these, when um, these exist, and they don't always exist, but when um, they exist, it's a really easy way for um, non non in indigenous like individuals to have access to that information, which would have already had to have like been um, like approved, right? You know, like a tribe won't, you know, like release any of the information unless, you know, they would like it attached to be out there. So the advice I would have would be to head to your like local um, uh, bookstore and or to hop online. Uh, I'd like to ask also, also if you are interested in place names ask the national parks and provincial parks to support place names, indigenous place names, because they need your voices. They need to be told to do it by the public. Um, our nation here, uh, Tri Tribal Park made signs with our place names and put them up at various places within our territory. And Parks Canada, where in places where the signs overlapped with Parks Canada Reserve, Parks Canada actually took them down and their reasoning was, well, they're not in French. They have to be in, in English and French as well. And so then there were some negotiations that happened on the side. Parks Canada promised that they would remake the signs for us and put the French as they wanted. It's been since 2013 and they have not made good on their promise. And I'm very disappointed. Um, and we're still trying to get our place names out. Um, so we need, you know, the Canadian public just to be like, hey, just leave those notes, leave them emails that they can put up their supervisor ladder up all the way up to Canada. And I think that'll get things shaking. Also, every national park in Canada has an official French translator on payroll. They should have an official Indigenous translator for every traditional territory where they're operating, um, who's actively participating in, in putting things out in our languages as well, wherever possible. Um, I think also place names are very personal. There's some nations who don't want to put their names out yet. Maybe they haven't decided yet. They're still talking about it. Uh, but our nation did come to that. Uh, we had a big uh, elder and chiefs meeting uh, back in 2012 and decided, yes, we want our names out. And that's when we made our signs that were taken down. So lots of work to be done. I just wanted to add something too is um, Giselle mentioned it that many of our place names are very intimate and that they're not necessarily going to be something you know like I feel like that's a very western question where can I find a list of these place names uh, it's relationship uh, I did canoe touring for example one summer with Giselle's younger sister and that was one of my first questions I said well I'm going to be in your territory I said I want to know what what things are called and what places are called and Simka was awesome. She went over and she went over a map with me and we practiced and she explained to me what details of little intricacies that she knew about these place names. And it wasn't just like, all right, go to www.plaopiate.placenames.com. It was a conversation that we were having. So I just wanted to mention that relationship piece. It's going to be very intimate and uh, it's going to be real. So um, even like what Jared said, you might find it online, but you'll be like, how the hell do I read that? Right? You need to understand. So I just wanted to add that piece. Thank you. Thank you for that. This is actually a question that's pretty related. So I just thought I would bang it out here, but it says, um, this is from TJ and it's for any panelists and it's regarding Giselle's de deconstruction of the term sharing. Um, what do you think of settlers who are working as guides in outdoor rec setting using indigenous place names and language as part of teaching clients about land and history? So kind of related to what you've been talking about, but specific to folks working in outdoor rec on, on the land. I think if the local nation wants to put their names out and has made those available, then go for it. And, and introduce them and talk about them. It might be good to even talk with your guests about you know, the idea of sharing and how the names belong there and please don't go home and name your, your pet zucchini the name or whatever, um, you know, just to be respectful. It's like when I do happen to tell a story, um, you know, I'm very careful about who I tell that story to now because of the dangers of appropriation. 
but beyond that there's there's so much information that we can we can talk about freely great thanks giselle um i'll do one or two more questions here i know it's it's almost 8 30 right now um, one of the questions from Sal is, are there recreational organizations that partnerships have developed with your communities? So for all panelists, if you want to respond to that. Um, where I live, it's actually a really like simple answer. No, I don't really know of any that are working with our tribe or our um, knowledge um, keepers. We did have some um, a German um, tourists that we were trying to work with our tribe for a while called um, Wilderness International. Actually, I wonder if you know those are ones who were asking about you know that word um, you know wilderness, but that was uh, years ago. Another like other than that, no, um, uh, no, I have not actually like seen any. Depends on your definition of recreation, but I know in many of our New Toronto communities, there is the Warriors program, which is pretty phenomenal, where the young boys have opportunities to go out onto the land. And um, I haven't been out there with them, but I've heard some really amazing uh, stories as a result of this Young Warriors program. So that's one example um, that I would share that I know is in at least three of our New Toronto communities. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like that's about it for- um, Giselle, Giselle wanted you to repeat that question real quick. Oh, for sure. Um, let me find it. <laughs> okay. Um, are there recreational organizations that have partnerships um, with your communities? There is one here actually, uh, Wild, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, but there's a zip line operating in Tlaoquit Tribal Parks, and they are, I believe, a partnership with Tlaoquit. Uh, Tlaoquit, our nation has declared all of our traditional territory a, thank you, Wild Clay, uh, tribal parks. And uh, we have a Tlaoquit Tribal Parks Allies program where we are inviting businesses that operate within our territory to be allies. And part of that is, to work on um, better respectfully representing our, our territory. So refraining from calling it wilderness, um, practicing the law of ESOC to be observant, to appreciate, act accordingly. Um, and uh, also give a ecosystem services fee for the protection and continued protection of our territory that really has subsidized the entire tourism industry in this area. Thanks so much. West Coast Wild is that the that's the zip line? Yeah, just like on the way down down that's the hill. Nice, right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah I uh, there was a question around around normalizing uh, place names too, and 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 I just saw it kind of roll by in the chat uh, quickly, and it um, a, a really uh, kind of neat memory I have about about starting to work uh, around uh, Giselle's nation's territory uh, years ago was that there's two there's one of the tribal parks is named after two uh, hills and and one of them wanna just is is commonly called lone cone just because I guess it's a cone that's kind of on its own uh, and the other one Hilthuis, I actually never learned the English name for it uh, until like pretty recently like a year ago and I just thought it was cool that I've always known this hill and known its name I think it's the only place that I learned the 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 real name for it first um, and it's just because you know so many of the of the people uh in 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 and around tofino who, who aren't colloquial also use it so i guess it's just you know force of habit and, and start using it and it has to start has to start somewhere um on on behalf of wilderness committee and the outdoor recreation council i want to thank uh, all of our speakers uh for 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 your words this evening for your stories and uh and you know I, I don't think we can talk about this enough and 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 understand these truths and this history enough. 
Um, I want to thank all of you for, for being here and listening this evening. I hope that uh, this can be a, a step towards growing the culture of responsibility around respect uh, and decolonization in outdoor spaces and outdoor recreation. Uh, and I encourage all of you to, to stay in touch around this work, uh, to contact us with any feedback you have uh, about tonight. And, uh, and thanks to everyone for participating. And I hope you have a, a great, rest of, great rest of your evening. Thank you.